From a studio high above the clouds of the Okanagan Valley, this is the Cannabis Podcast. Exploring the world of Canadian cannabis culture, one toke at a time. Now, here's your host and bud tender, Gary Johnston. It is my pleasure to welcome you back to the Cannabis Podcast. Thanks for coming back. Maybe this is your very first visit. If it is, well, I have an especially warm welcome for you. I had, let's say, 30 or 40 minutes filled with information. Let's see, what's it going to be about? Probably cannabis. (laughs) I assume you have some interest in the plant just like I do. Well, before we get too much further, let me remind you, this program is intended only for those 19 or older in your jurisdiction and is intended primarily for entertainment and perhaps educational purposes. You should always consume your cannabis responsibly. And on episode 148... (laughs) In this episode, I'm going to opine a little bit about the fact that some very old weed is still being sold for top dollar, something we have to get better at. Recent help for the alcohol industry has cannabis people saying, hey, what about us? The Netherlands cannabis experiment continues, got an update on that. I have a conversation with Jason Ambrosino of Veteran Holdings, who gives us a glimpse into the New York cannabis market and the importance of access. I'm going to stop on Cultivar Corner, of course, for Prohibition Flowers Gastro Pop. And we have some suggestions for those in the industry to make their voice heard on the excise tax. All of that and more on episode 148 of the Cannabis Podcast. And before we get too much further, let me thank you for being here. I truly appreciate the fact that you are a listener of the Cannabis Podcast. Not only that, but I also really appreciate my subscribers. At buymeacoffee.com slash cannabis podcast, you can go there too if you feel so inclined and you like what you hear and buy me a doobie. Jordana, Kevin, and Jordan, thank you so much for your support. I truly appreciate it. And over at Patreon, I want to thank my patrons, Tony, Roger, Gage, Rob, and Lloyd. I appreciate your support every single time. Thank you. Now, I also have to share with you today that I experienced a little disappointment over the last week or two. (laughs) I had originally done an entire cultivar corner that expressed my (laughs) lack of desire but I realized that I was going a little too heavy and hard, so I decided to just encompass my thoughts in just a couple of sentences here to make sure that I express them, but not spend too much time on it. And that is, we have to pay more attention to the <laughs> how old our cannabis is. I know that on our, all of our packaging, it says, no expiry dates determined. But let's be honest, really good cannabis in a really good state does not stay that way forever. I unfortunately picked up some cannabis from a local shop last week, (laughs) eager to just pick up an eighth, go home and and smoke it, really looking forward to it, got home, (laughs) forgot to check the package date, forgot to get a a receipt, got home, checked my package date. The cannabis was six months old. It was packaged, it, (laughs) it was harvested in August of last year, it was packaged in September of last year, and I paid full price for it. It was not worth full price. (laughs) This is something that we as an industry have to figure out. We have to get better at this. Because anytime somebody walks into a cannabis store, walks out with some old weed that they paid full price for, they're not going to be happy just like I wasn't happy. So there's nothing an individual can do, but it's something we as an industry need to pay more attention to. Let's recycle those packages <laughs> so our best before dates don't sit in a warehouse for six months before somebody picks up that weed, goes home, tries it, and says, wow, this isn't very good. <laughs> I just had to share my disappointment. We're going to mjbizdaily.com, a story written by Matt Lamers. Dutch authorities have ironed out issues involving the Netherlands cannabis experiment, government and industry officials told MJ Biz Daily. The experiment, which underwent a startup phase in December ahead of the full launch later this year, aims to close the supply chain and bring it under the watchful eyes of federal regulators for the first time. For decades, the country's cannabis stores, also called coffee shops, operated in a system where sales were legally tolerated while cultivation remained illegal meaning stores had to procure illicit marijuana products to sell quasi-legally. Officials said the startup phase, which involved two Dutch cities, helped to work out kinks including track and trace issues and distribution limits. One of the biggest issues hindering the nascent program had been a rule restricting coffee shops to an on-hand stock of no more than 500 grams, or 17.6 ounces of regulated cannabis products at a time. 
the limit caused stores to run out of product frequently, creating supply bottlenecks. To sum it up in a sentence, too little weed, problems with the track and trace system, and a pretty much unworkable maximum of 500 gram stock. Derek Bergman, a cannabis industry expert and columnist for online cannabis lifestyle magazine CNNBS, told MJ Biz Daily. I was actually waiting in line at a coffee shop before my interview with their manager when the last baggie of regulated weed was sold before my eyes, Bergman said. The Dutch government recently changed the 500 ground limit, announcing that mayors in towns participating in the experiment can now decide how much cannabis coffee shops are allowed to stock. All in all, a lot of growing pains, although none is so bad that it jeopardizes the experiment, Bergman said. Oraville Borenshen, Managing Director for Netherlands-based Lady Holland and Chief Operating Officer of British Columbia's Pure Sun Farms, called the experiment a historic moment for Dutch society and the industry. Lely Holland, owned by Village Farms International, the parent company of Pearson Farms, is one of the cultivators chosen to supply coffee shops. The company expects to begin shipping cannabis products in early 2025. What we have right now is not sustainable. It's impossible to sell cannabis legally and decriminalize it, but have it grown illegally. For the first time, consumers can know they're getting safe and tested cannabis. I think that's a huge benefit. The experiment has two stages before it officially launches later this year. The initial phase that started in December is designed to test the systems and processes involved in operating a closed cannabis supply chain. The next stage, called the transitional phase, is set to begin in June. It will last roughly six weeks before the experiment officially begins. Cannabis products allowed in the experiment include dried flour, edibles, hashish, and pre-rolled joints. A health ministry official told MJ Biz Daily the initial phase of the Dutch experiment has been aimed at learning so that the next phase can run smoothly. The first month of the startup phase went well, the official said. The spokesperson also said there were a few malfunctions in the track and trace system during the first few months, but added we are not aware of any other issues. The spokesperson didn't elaborate on the track and trace issues, how widespread they were, who was affected, or for how long. Britain Mayor Paul Diepler said the experiment started in the two cities to give the government an opportunity to learn before it's expanded. That's very useful because then we can see how track and trace and distribution logistics work and how consumers react to the new products, he told MJ Biz Daily in a phone interview. For more than 40 years, Dempla said the front door of the coffee shop was legal, but the back door was illegal. In that spirit, we're trying to make a closed supply chain from production to consumption where there's no room for illegal activities. Lely Holland's Bofenshin said he's not concerned about the early track and trace and supply issues, and the company is proceeding as planned. Some Dutch experts have mixed feelings about the experiment, saying it effectively defers the possibility of meaningful legal reform until the pilot ends in 2028-29. Joop Mestrom, co-owner of publishing company Yosa Media and founder of CNNBS, wants to see home cultivation permitted. There's not one word about this in the so-called with experiment that will take our nation to 2028-29 before we can begin to discuss full legalization, including homegrown weed. Well, there you go. Some interesting occurrences in the Netherlands as their experiment with changing the whole coffee shop <laughs> venues, which were, of course, you were legal to buy it, but it was illegal cannabis coming through the back door. <laughs> Strange concept, and the changes are underway in the Netherlands. And another important thing that I wanted to cover off this episode, and that is... The Standing Committee on Finance has made a recommendation for the 2024 federal budget to change the excise tax. Whoa! <laughs> have we been asking for that since the beginning of time? <laughs> yes, we have. I want to thank Velvet Kavanaugh, Velvet from phenologic.ca. She's doing a lot of work making this really easy for everybody. She sent out a template uh, which people can use to send to Christian Freeland about the excise tax. And let me give you a sample of what that letter is going to say. It's asking you to write in support of the recommendation published in the House of Commons Standing Committee on Finance. What they're doing is asking you to share your story. Currently, licensed producers pay up to 35% of gross sales and taxes. Excise tax stamp operational costs can amount to 10% of production costs. 40% of all CCAA filings in 2022 were for cannabis companies. And 47% of all cannabis license revocations in the last five years happened in 2023. This is really important, and this has to be delivered by March 29th. So you don't have much time. If you go to the Cannabis Podcast webpage, you'll find a link to the template there. You can grab that template, personalize it, get your own story in that, and then get it off to Minister Freeland before March 29th so this can be considered and we can fix that dang excise tax. It's about time, and please don't let the opportunity pass you by. 
from the Cannabis Infused Studio in the Clouds, this is the Cannabis Podcast. So today I am discussing cannabis, which is no surprise, of course, since this is the Cannabis Podcast. And today we have a pioneering entrepreneur and a retired service-disabled Army veteran. He's at the forefront of innovation in the cannabis and hemp industries in New York through his ventures Veteran Holdings and Veteran Temp Market. Leveraging his military discipline and a commitment to excellence, Jason Ambrosino has introduced groundbreaking cannabis and hemp products in New York State, focusing on quality, therapeutic benefits, and community support, especially for veterans. As the driving force behind American Veteran Enterprise Team LLC, specializing in procurement and logistics, and the creator of leading brands like New York Honey, Space Buds, and Veterans Choice Creations, Jason offers unmasked expertise, strategic insights, and a fervent commitment to the cannabis industry's growth. And of course, the cannabis industry's growth is something the Cannabis Podcast has been interested in since we started almost six years ago. Jason Ambrosino, welcome to the Cannabis Podcast. Oh, thank you so much for, for having me on. It's uh, it's an honor to be able to kind of share our story and what's going on in New York. Yeah, absolutely. And and as, as you know, the focus of this program is typically on what's happening in the Canadian cannabis marketplace. But cannabis is used all around the world. And when I was approached by uh, one of your representatives about having you on, I thought, you know what? I want to hear what's happening in New York. So why don't we start, Jason, with my typical question, where does your cannabis story begin? Well, my cannabis story begins pretty much at the end of my Army career. And, you know, I was I was in the Army for a decade. I was an officer, had served several commands, uh, you know, tour of combat duty, uh, which was in Iraq, south, southeast Baghdad from, you know, 05, 07 was the, was the time we were there. And, you know, I, I had uh, got to the point where I had to, to medically retire because I had gotten blown up while I was in, kind of messed up my neck and my back. And finally, it caught up to me years later, and it was time to retire. And if the Army tells you when it's time to retire, you don't get to choose. So uh, it was time to retire, and, and I retired as a 100% service-disabled veteran. And I was on, uh, you know, a, a number of medications uh, because... You know that's kind of how our medicate our 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 system works uh, health wise, right? Same thing in Canada is, um, you know, it's we, we we really turn to the the synthetics of pharmaceutical industries to solve our problems, and sometimes it doesn't necessarily solve them. Sometimes it makes them worse. So for me anyway, you know, I had gotten out of the army. You know, here they're trying to medicate me for the the different issues that I'm bringing up, like the the pain, the not being able to sleep, things like that. But all the medications they're giving me are, are questionable, right? Like at one point in time, I was on 2,500 milligrams a day of uh, gabapentin, which, you know, is now a medication that they question whether it's, it's even safe to be giving people. You know, they, they tied so much of how people felt and why they couldn't explain certain pains into, you know, the, the, the concept of, well, there must be a depression aspect to this. Well, no, the, the pain's causing the, the depression, right? The pain is from inflammation or what have you. Re- regardless, they had me on a number of medications. And uh, I went to work for my family at the time, and I really wasn't happy with my performance. I kind of felt like my, my family was putting me on, you know, because I was their son, which is, of course, what they would do. Um, you know, especially being that I was a, you know, retired service member, 100% service disabled, they're going to give me what they think I need to succeed or feel whole. But, you know, I knew that I wasn't all I could be. Uh, and a lot of it was because of the medications I was on. They just left me completely zombified. Um, you know, the, the, I would wake up and I would just feel like I was in a dream. I would feel like I was still in a dream. There would be this fog. And, you know, I sat down one day and I decided to read a book and, uh, the, the book was acid test by Stan. I can't remember his last name. I think it's Schroeder or Slate or something like that. And it wasn't the acid test that everybody is familiar with. Like this was a more modern, recent, um, publication. And this was written about different psychedelic medications that, uh, were being used therapeutically uh, by organizations like Normal uh, doing secret studies. And they included LSD, they included, um, you know, psilocybin, and uh, they also talked about cannabis and marijuana. Um, they didn't, you know, do too much. They, they mentioned ketamine, but uh, it, more, it was more the, the, the psychedelics that, you know, we really know as true psychedelics, which we're seeing now as they're allowed to research it. Oh, you know, we were right all along. These things are profoundly important for fixing a broken psyche. Well, I took it upon myself to say I need to do something different. So I decided that I was going to go to the, the, this is the raw story. I decided I was going to go to the deep web and I was going to buy myself some acid. And uh, so I went and I, and I went to the deep web and I bought myself three hits of acid. Now, I'm somebody who just got out of the army. I've never taken any drugs before. 
uh, not even cannabis, right? So I decided, well, you know, I believe what this book is telling me and I think that I've been misled. And when you get out of the military, um, if you truly are being reflective on, on your career in humanity, you have to question what you did. You have to. And if you're, if you're not, then I, I, I wonder what else you're repressing because, you know, humans aren't supposed to have to hurt other humans. There's a psychopath, the psychopathy attached to that, whether you're considering somebody your enemy or not. Regardless, um, you know, all the talk treatment is just telling you that it's not your fault. Well, it, sometimes it takes a little bit more than that. And what this book kind of talked about was, you know, how LSD could essentially be used as the sledgehammer. And then they come in with MDMA as like a fine chisel, which happens to be the model that they're now, you know, studying. So I came in with three hits of, of LSD and it was the most profound experience that I had. It, it changed my life. It sent me in a totally different direction. Uh, I realized that if I didn't get off those medications on my own, that I, nobody was going to take me off of them. And uh, I needed to find something different if I wanted to be whole and complete. And the thing that made the most amount of sense at the time was cannabis. And uh, I turned to cannabis and I started looking at what, not just, all right, I'm going to go get myself some THC here and it's going to do the trick. How can I play with these cannabinoids to give me the effect that I'm looking for? And I started really diving into the research, reading really the science aspect of it, how these cannabinoids, how these terpenes affect your individual bodies and how your body's body chemistry can affect that. And what you learn is that cannabis is an incredibly personal experience. And one of the problems with having this natural, in, you know, even if we do an extraction, still pretty much a natural product. The problem is, is that nobody can determine what every single person's body chemistry is and in and how that cultivar or how that combination of cannabinoids affects you is so heavily dependent upon that. It can change every day and you need to know and understand how you've got to change what you're doing in order for it to continue to work for you. So for me, it was all about helping me at the time. So I did it. And it worked. And I was like, you know what? I'm feeling good enough to start my own business. And I opened up a procurement logistics company. Um, I ended up leaving my parents' company and, you know, essentially began taking care of myself, my own business, employees, everything else. Within a few years, we were, we were doing very well. In 2018, the farm bill came around. And it was at that point that I realized, okay, well, all of this helped me. And in my research, what I'm learning is that all these other cannabinoids are, are, you know, just as important when we're talking about therapeutic potential, if that's what we're truly looking for. A lot of people say that, but really they just want to get high, which is totally fine. Sometimes we need that. But there's this therapeutic potential of stuff that we don't think is working that truly is. And that's where, you know, your CBDs and your CBGs and your CBNs, they all come in. And when put together in the, in the proper order, they're profoundly effective, doing remarkable things that would be considered modern medicine, you know, to the nth degree. CBG, for example, right? It's going to be the mother of future generations of antibiotics as we see it being used to kill things like Mercer and staph. Uh, there's so many of these avenues we haven't gone down. So it was obvious to me that this was the way in. This was how to get people what they needed in order to get off a lot of uh, prescription medications that they were on. So we ended up opening Veterans Hep Market we got everything in order so that we were manufacturing our own products. And we came in at a sweeping number, undercutting the whole market, because for us, it was about access. And that still is kind of what we do today, is it's about access. I will sacrifice the, pro the profit and not take the investor if it means that I can bring more access to the people. Because that, to me, that's what this is all about, right? And, and I know people worry about the bottom falling out of an industry. You know, we've got to protect the profits. I, I just, I, I can't get behind all that. To me, commoditization means price stabilization. And while that might not be what everybody sees or wants to see, that is what's going to allow access at, in the nth degree. In 2018, we opened up Veterans Hemp Market with those principles in mind and we became a staple for the community. Uh, imagine a head shop that's not a head shop, at least certainly doesn't look like one. You get more of a health feeling when you walk in and uh, really one-on-one -on -one conversations about how these cannabinoids can change or affect your life. Conversations the FDA doesn't really want us to have, but we have to have these because enough, you know, enough with the lies and the nonsense, we have to be honest with people about how this can potentially affect, help you. But I'm gonna tell you, it might not help you at all. The only way is for you to try it and figure out if it's something for you. 
And we began to do this and we, we began to get repeat customers and we got a really good reputation and relationship with the community, a community that my family has been part of for, you know, a hundred years. And we really became a staple And the stories that would come through the door about how profoundly, including a lot of veterans, how profoundly these things that we were building helped them. Um, it, 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 it just does something to you and you realize how important this is. And it's so much more important than, than, than money. And you realize that, all right, well, that's where the whole entire access comes in. The cheaper it gets, the more access people have to it. That's the hope. Because of New York State, we really got an, uh, an uphand advantage because they came out and they said, we really messed up our legalization and uh, we need people involved immediately. You know, Governor Cuomo had left, Governor Hochul stepped in and, uh, and then there was this rush to create this cannabis industry that had been sat on for, for several years. They said, well, if you were doing this in hemp, it makes sense you have all the equipment to do it for marijuana. And they began issuing the licenses out. So we were one of 40 manufacturers that ended up getting licensed for New York State. And I mean, it was a fight. It was a fight because, you know, for the first eight months of the year, there was only 17 dispensaries open. So, you know, to, to get shelf space was a war. Um, but it was a war that, you know, worked out well for us because of the principles that we had in mind, which is, you know, you build your business not to make money, but to make change. And that's where we came into where we are now, which is Gloversville, New York, super depressed area in upstate New York, uh, median household income, household income being $41,000 a year. This is a, a, a profoundly depressed, repressed, suppressed area uh, that was huge up until the 1960s. And then their entire manufacturing base left. Uh, prior to the 1960s, if you bought a pair of leather gloves, and I'm sure it was the same way in Canada, we probably sent them out there. If you bought a leather, a leather pair of gloves, they were being manufactured right here in Gloversville, New York. And all of that industry left. So they were left with a shell and we kind of said, you know, uh, if we can bring industry back, if we can, if we can use, you know, the, 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 what we believe, right, which is to, to help first and then everything else will come behind it. Um, we can really do something special for this community. And, and that was the premise of what we've done. That's what's allowed us to grow our brands the way we've grown them. We've kept prices down. You know, everybody thought it was about undercutting the market. And, and for us, it was like, no, we know what we could charge, but we're in a lucky position of not taking investors, having all this internal knowledge where, you know, I was doing this on the black market before I started doing it on the legal market. I didn't mention that, but I didn't get the knowledge from nowhere, right? It had to come from somewhere. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's helped us tremendously. And, and that's, kind of, that's kind of the gist of how we got to where we are today. Excellent. With what you're doing, give me an idea, because you, you mentioned you're already in it, and I was really pleased to hear a couple of things that you mentioned. The fact that access is really key. We have to be getting people access to the medicine that they need. The understanding that you also put out there in, in that the, the other cannabinoids, the other terpenes are all playing their effect and we are all unique. We all receive our cannabis differently. So give me a sense, Jason, of some of the products that you have developed uh, that are currently available in the New York market. Well, our carts are the uh, New York honey. It's actually the fifth, uh, number five best selling cart in New York state right now. And we had a lot of compliments on the oil and, and, you know, we're lower potency than, you know, a lot of these guys pushing for 90 plus percent carts, which to me doesn't make any sense. It's an isolate. You know, what we kind of do differently is, is we, we build cannabinoid blends. So if we're looking for a certain effect, you know, if we want something to be more of a couch lock, you know, and somebody, we still are, are battling with this sativa and indica. Um, As we all are. Yeah. Nonsense. Right. And yeah. it's our own fault. That's how we marketed it for years. That's how <laughs> people is. respond to it, you know? Yeah. Um, but, you know, we're able to kind of like mimic the indica effect that people are expecting by adding a little CBN in, right? Or maybe a few other miners. Or we're able to increase like the energy aspect of the cart by adding a little THCV in. Or maybe, you know, something that is more like an extended duration hash type pen by increasing the amount of, of, of CBD. Uh, you know, if we want something that's got a muted high feeling, we can add in a little bit of CBG and it really doesn't take much. It's just one or 2% here or there that can really change the effect overall on the whole product. Uh, you know, that's just kind of what we do with our carts. And we've, we've tried really hard to kind of, uh, embrace a more environmentally studious, I guess, position in trying to get people to refill their own, you know, their own carts, their own syringes. We've come up with a syringe that people can refill with, um, you know, our, our 
important product really is, is and one of the ones that we, we really have undercut that i mean we, i don't think we make much money on it but that's not the point of putting it out there is our fico uh, we've had just so many people prior to us actually being licensed who we used to provide fico for full extract cannabis oil uh, ethanol extracted uh, crude basically uh, same thing as rso at the end of the day uh, and we we've provided so much of that we've provided for free before we were licensed and uh, the response to it was so profound and it was all medical needs right so people who have insurance can't afford it otherwise you go to the medical dispensary in New York State and you're going to spend eighty dollars a gram where you can go and you can pick ours up for forty dollars a gram in a recreational dispensary so that's how important we think it is you know I mean we we tried to make it as accessible as, as possible and you know a, a, a one gram of fico lasts a long time for forty dollars it's actually something you might actually you know, consider a, a pretty good deal but for us there's just so many people out there that are like this is our last this is my last hope this is my last chance this is my hail mary if it works it works if it's not you know at least i tried so that's a very important product for me to be able to have available we wish more dispensaries would carry that it's not as glittery and glamoury and shiny packaging so it's hard to get on dispensary shelves we also were very diversified. Uh, you know, I really believe in cannabis topicals as well. And water solubility has really allowed us to kind of really explore that avenue. But we have some oil base. We do like a warrior bomb. So the health side of it is, um, again, it's, it's, a, it's a topical that's really helped uh, people tremendously, our, our topical products that helps me tremendously with my neck. I would probably say it's the product I use most often. But we've, we've even tried to go all the way. I don't know if you've seen any of the recent research articles about... Um, uh, cannabis and uh, fem like uh, helps women who have painful intercourse. And there's research that just came out on all that. And we just uh, put together, we haven't launched it yet, but we just put together like a water soluble personal lubricant. So we're trying to really kind of like bridge ourselves across, you know, the health side of it as much as we are the recreational side where, you know, we're still do, we do our own hash. Uh, we do cured hash. I was, uh, you know, Frenchie, uh, Frenchie fan, just like so many people were, uh, you know, had the, had the luxury of, of talking to Frenchie on a, on a few different occasions and, uh, brilliant, brilliant man. Uh, you know, so we, we get into the oils, we do ethanol extractions, we do, um, uh, solventless extractions. We, we do some of our own pressing, uh, you know, we're looking to get in butane, but really, you know, we have the capacity and the capability to produce just about anything somebody's imagination can think up. Oh, where do you see the future going uh, in, in New York and, and around the world? Where, where would you like to see us heading, Jason? I mean, I think that, that we are not that far off to where, you know, even in the Canada and the United States, we're going to be able to, you know, trade freely across borders. I, I, I don't think it's that. Once we get federal legalization in, in, in the United States, and it seems like with some court cases going on, that might be sooner than later, just because of uh, they're using they're using a gay marriage argument. So back in the day when all the states were passing laws that basically legalized gay marriage, uh, the federal government recognized gay marriage without any sort of uh, necessary action, you know, legalizing it. And that essentially is the argument that now some of the bigger cannabis players, like Truly, for example, are using to say. In, in the United States, there's a, a, a tax code called 280E. It's very punitive. It doesn't let us deduct any of our expenses. So we essentially end up getting taxed full boat on our gross sales. And it's very, very punitive. And it makes uh, having a successful cannabis business in the U.S. very difficult. So that's going to go away. That's going to help tremendously. And then we're going to see some trade open up. I do think that the biggest threats that both Canada and the United States are going to be facing is the same threats that we've faced when it comes to um, any type of um, um, farm-based commodity is uh, South America. There's tremendous farms that are already built up in Colombia by some of the biggest players it's where a lot of the seeds are coming from, a lot of the genetics are being kept there. And, you know, they can produce the just amazing cannabis for 35 cents a gram. So there may be this time where things are going to have to change a little about how we look at the cannabis industry and some of the more developed, uh, I would say, mature marketplaces in the world, like like the United States, for example. Um, you know, we might turn into more of seeing more like a service type businesses develop here to where it's more brokering some of these big, you know, commodity deals or, you know, getting the extracts or getting the raw materials from larger, you know, mega labs and then building products out from that. 
there will be room for craft stuff, but you know, as always, craft becomes a hobby more often than not. Well, excellent. You've given us a, a interesting perspective and view of what's happening in the New York market. Do you uh, eventually hope that you might uh, be able to ship some products up north? Well, that's always the hope, right? So, you know, if, if we get large enough to be recognized, you know, in, in New York and in, in this marketplace, I think it's a good launching pad for many different marketplaces. Uh, we actually manufacture uh, Lobo, which I, I do believe is in the Canadian market as well. So if you see Lobo products out there, uh, we're, their, we're their New York State manufacturer, you know, but maybe one of these days we'll be getting, being able to get a licensing deal in Canada for our products. That would be, that would be fantastic. Excellent. Let me finish, Jason, with my uh, hot seat questions. Just a couple of short ones to get your response. Um, uh, what is your favorite cultivar? Ooh, um, my favorite, probably uh, Mimosa. Mimosa. Nice. Hmm. Yeah, that sounds sweet. Uh, joints or vape? Vape. Edibles or flour? Oof. Depends on the mood. I'm going to say edibles. No, I'm going to say flour. Okay. Tough well, one. Mostly flour. I know, I know it's a little tough one. <laughs> and, and because you are in a different jurisdiction, your typical term for 3.5 grams of cannabis? 3.5 grams. An eighth. Okay. Yeah, the, the, the standard. Uh, there has been some differences across the country. So thanks for the insight, Jason. Uh, I appreciate knowing a little bit more about the New York market. Thanks for sharing your your ideas for the future. Anything else for you? No, uh, thank you very much for having us. And uh, I wish you guys the best of luck. And I hope pretty soon we'll be able to you know trade freely. Yeah, wouldn't that be nice? Excellent. You enjoy the rest of your day, Jason. Thanks so much. Thanks. You take care. THC, CBD, terpene profiles, what's in me? Oh, please explain to me. Go to the corner. Go to the corner. Oh, yeah. Go to the corner. Please explain this stuff to me. Well, I got a new order in from Mendo this last week. And that's one of the things we're going to be featuring on Cultivar Corner today. I pick up some stuff from Mendo fairly regularly, and the boxes are usually about the same size. This week, when it arrived, I'd only ordered two half grams, or already, sorry, two half ounces. <laughs> two half grams, yeah, right? <laughs> but I was surprised that the box was so big. And that's part of what we're talking about in Cultivar Corner today, is the ever-changing packaging that's happening in Canadian cannabis. So, first of all, let me tell you what we're doing. This is from Prohibition Flower, Connoisseur Curated Flower, and we're doing their Gastro Pop, which is an indica. We'll talk about the THC on that in a moment. But first of all, let's talk about the packaging. So I've heard rumors <laughs> that some cannabis companies were going to start distributing their cannabis in glass cedar jars. Well, that explains why I got a really big package. <laughs> Because this is 14 grams inside a glass cedar jar. Really nice. Really, really think that's a great idea. But even better than that, we have to get to the glass first, right? And that's got to be packaged in something. And this was a big freaking Mylar bag. <laughs> like, really big. <laughs> but here's the cool part of it. You know how we have all been struggling to open those cannabis packages? You know, those ones that are supposed to peel apart at the top and, and you're just supposed to pinch it and move it, <laughs> but it's impossible to get to get purchased to be able to pinch it? <laughs> they fixed it. I got a bag here from Prohibition Flower, uh, which held this 14 gram cedar jar inside of it. So it's a big bag. And right up at the top left corner, there is a piece that says pinch here and it has texture. So your fingers stick to it and it actually pinches and moves. They finally figured it out. Now, if we can only see that on more of our packaging. <laughs> so now let's tell you a little bit about what we're talking about today. This is Prohibition Flower. As I say, connoisseur curated flower. At Prohibition Flower, we want to support the legacy growers that made the jump to microcultivators to be a showcase for all the amazing work they do, share the skills they've learned over the years of cultivating. Our mission is to bring nothing but clean burning, clean tasting flour to the market. We're all about the white ash over here. Ash tells a lot about the quality and care that has gone into flower cultivation. We came from the legacy world and in many years of cultivation experience under our belts. We can tell you what quality flour is because of our years of experience cultivating the amazing plant. We believe that to build your trust in business, we need to be open and transparent. We will have each batch number with all the strain info from breeders, parents, type of medium, type of nutrients used, length of grow, how it was dried, cured, trimmed, so you can make a better informed choice when looking for quality flour. 
Well, let's test some of that. <laughs> I have my label on here in front of me. So this was premium cured cannabis flour. It's a half ounce, hang dried, hand trimmed, hand packed, non irradiated. Terpenes total 4.74. I'm not getting much else from that. Oh, yes, I am. So the cultivator was Amani Craft, and Amani Craft is actually from Kelowna. And let's tell you about Amani Craft right now. Amani Craft is in Kelowna, BC, right next door to me. <laughs> well, actually, they're probably a little ways away. <laughs> Their methods of growing are traditional tables with drip feeding, data-driven crop steering, fully automated feeding, and environmental controls. Amani Craft grows craft cannabis with data-driven crop steering, which allows them to maximize the potential of the plant by efficiently feeding the plants with just what they need to grow to their maximum potential. By doing so, less waste is created and the quality is unmatched. Well, I gotta say, the flower that I'm looking at here, grown by Amani Craft, and distributed by Prohibition Flower is really, really dense <laughs> and sticky. Oh, I couldn't believe it when I... First of all, you open the jar and aromas. Oh, just bountiful aromas. My terps, my terps at 4.74. So that's probably one of the reasons why it is as fruity as it is. Really, really a nice taste. Really, really enjoying how this... Oh, how this smells. And when I pull a bud out to get my joint ready. <laughs> and I got a fairly substantive bud here. Uh, my, my stick test, which is typically what I'll do. How sticky is that? And I've got a fairly big bud here and it is just sticking to my finger as I raise it way far up above the table. Oh, really, really sticky. Really, really resiny. Oh, it just your fingers get sticky with it. <laughs> and I just love weed like that. So I'm liking the glass jar. I'm liking the improvements to the packaging, liking everything else about that. How about we see if we like the flower? Because that would be the next step. I'll get my Air Max warmed up, so we'll be ready to go when we're ready. And once that is prepping, we'll light the joint and we'll have a taste of... Now, the other disappointment when I go onto the website for Prohibition Flower, they don't actually have this cultivar. <laughs> Oftentimes, I'm too far ahead of the, of the mix. <laughs> They haven't added it to the website yet. So this cultivar is Gastro Pop. There's no information on Prohibition Flower about this particular cultivar. But on my bag, it tells me uh, it is aroma and flavor is funky, grape, berry, gassy, and fuel. And the appearance is dense, sticky, and resinous. My top five terps, osamine, pinene, myrcene, caryophylline, and linalool. It's time for a taste. This is Prohibition Flower grown by a money craft, and this is Gastro Pop. Oh, I love that cool, smooth first toke. Always enjoyable. Oh, yeah, very nice. Okay, definitely some of those gassy notes are coming through. I suspect the osamine may bring a touch of some candy notes to it. And I'm picking up some of that on my exhale. What are the relevant, important pieces of this? My THC is sitting at 29.36. And this is the other thing that I wanted to comment on. Not only is the packaging really, really nice uh, and up to date, but this was harvested on January 20th and it was packaged on March 6th. And I'm recording this cultivar corner on March 22nd. So that's pretty quick to get the product out to market. Two or three hits so far off of the joint. Endocannabinoid system starting to fire up. And really enjoying how smooth the smoke is inhaling off of the joint. Mm, endocannabinoid system is starting to roll around, starting to get some happy eyes. Let's have a taste off of the Air Max of Prohibition Flower and their Gastro Pop. Oh, wow. Much more of the gassy notes come out. Some of the fruity notes as well. Mm, the grape, the berry. <laughs> Delicious. I just love the way weed tastes in a vaporizer. Mmm. Oh, yeah. Just so much more flavor. And boy, is this weed ever sticky. This is some of the stickiest stuff we've had of recent. Really nicely done. 
So a Monte Craft here in Kelowna growing some pretty fine weed. Oh yeah. <laughs> and here come the Happy Eyes Gangbusters now. Just love the taste of this. Both in the joint and in the vaporizer. Again, the vaporizer just has so much more flavor elements to it. Oh, really, really nice. <laughs> and speaking of really, really nice. <laughs> oh, there's the happy eyes. There's the smile. There's the euphoria. <laughs> now, at 29.65% THC, uh, and leaning towards a fairly heavy indica, what are the cross of this one? I haven't given that for. So this was apples and bananas crossed with grape gas. That's how they came up with gastro pop. <sighs> In typical fashion, this is my first hit of the day. And this being a fairly heavy indica could mean it's time for another nap for Gary today. But that's all right. I'm here to do my job, and, and I take my job seriously. And it's important that we get an accurate assessment of how this stuff works. First, The first hit of the day, generally the best way for me to know whether the weed's going to work. And let me follow that up with, this weed is working. <laughs> So a many craft are the growers prohibition flower are the people who are distributing it. <laughs> some pretty fine weed. Maybe it is still time for some prohibition. And in typical fashion, <laughs> after the cannabinoids have been rolling around my endocannabinoid system for a little bit more time. <laughs> deeper and deeper and deeper. <laughs> This is just coming on really strong now. Really uh, heavy. Not so much in the head, more in the body. I mean, there's there's definitely some head stuff going on. I've got some euphoria there. My happy eyes are here. I'm really blasted. <laughs> but it's going more into a nice little relaxing body stone. And there's never anything wrong with that either. So, <laughs> Prohibition Flower, their gastro pop grown by a many craft here in Kelowna. Mm -mm -mm. Boy, this country can grow some pretty fine weed. Sharing stories about good weed while trying good weed. This is the Cannabis Podcast. And another story from StratCan.com today. This on the cannabis industry wondering when their relief is coming too. In an announcement on March 9th, the Canadian government said it plans to provide thousands of dollars in alcohol excise duty relief to Canadian businesses, particularly local craft breweries. Canada's cannabis industry has been asking for similar relief for years, with some noting their industry is larger and more heavily taxed and regulated than even beer makers. In order to help alcohol businesses, the federal government is proposing to cap the inflation adjustment at 2% for beer, spirit, and wine excise duties for an additional two years, and to cut the excise duty rate on the first 15,000 hectoliters of beer brewed in Canada by half for two years. The government says this will provide the typical craft brewery up to $86,000 in additional tax relief in 2024-25. In a press release, with comments from Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Finance Christian Freeland and Minister of Small Business Richie Valdez, the government acknowledges the number of jobs created by the brewing industry in Canada and the contribution this makes to the broader economy. This announcement is great news for breweries, distilleries and wineries from all across Canada who contribute so much to our national economy, says Valdez. Not only are they producing incredible products, they're also small businesses who are creating jobs and opportunities in their local communities. Today's relief on alcohol to excise taxes will allow craft breweries to spend less on duties and more on what matters most, growing and innovating their small businesses. Jonathan Wilson, CEO of Crystal Cure, a small-scale cannabis producer in New Brunswick, said he found the news difficult to swallow given how much his industry is currently struggling. For the ministers to announce this excise tax relief for alcohol today, with the core message being to support small business in peril, is one of two things, cold-hearted or oblivious, and I can't tell which one. Small cannabis producers that have been suffering under the current industry ecosystem, they're the ones without the cash flow to absorb the exorbitant taxes and fees, and they can't sell at a loss in perpetuity. These producers were supposed to be the cornerstones of the industry, and it seems everyone is fine with them being allowed to crumble. Deepak Anand, an industry analyst and consultant, shared similar sentiments with Strachan. The federal government needs to urgently make some similar provisions available for the cannabis industry, which has been struggling much harder than the alcohol industry. Much like alcohol... There are dozens of craft cannabis cultivators who can benefit greatly from similar relief. For a comparison, 
According to StatsCan in 2022, breweries employed nearly 23,000 Canadians. A Deloitte report from 2021 said the cannabis industry employed more than 43,000 direct and another 180,000 indirect jobs in its first three years. In 2018, the Conference Board of Canada reported that the beer industry supported 149,000 Canadian jobs, paid $5.3 billion in wages and contributed $13.6 billion to Canada's GDP in 2016. A Deloitte report from 2021 said the Canadian cannabis industry contributed $45.5 billion to Canada's GDP in its first three years, or an average of about $15 billion a year. Canada's small craft breweries are among the finest in the world and are an important contributor to our growing economy by creating jobs in communities across the country. Today's announcement is good news for Canadians and for the craft breweries they visit, which now will benefit from thousands of dollars in new tax relief every year, said Freeland in a press release. Well, (laughs) as the story points out, (laughs) where is this similar relief for the cannabis industry? (laughs) Apparently it's okay to drink up, but you better not be smoking. Once again, thank you so much for being here. I truly appreciate the fact that you are a listener. And now, as we like to do, let's end with a little bit of humor. Today, we're heading to a site called upjoke.com. You know, it's pretty strange. Doctors are now prescribing cannabis for arthritis sufferers. I mean, the definition of arthritis is inflammation of the joint. So I phoned the drug's helpline, and the voice on the phone said, for advice on cannabis, press hash. A cop sees a suspicious teenager driving erratically and pulls him over. The policeman notices the driver's red eyes and the smell of cannabis on his breath, so asks him if he's been smoking pot. The teenager says, yeah, but I've got a prescription for it. What's the prescription for? inquires the officer. Anxiety. But I only get it when a cop pulls me over. And that's it for episode 148 of the Cannabis Podcast. From the cannabis-infused studio, high above the Okanagan Valley, this was the Cannabis Podcast. Thanks for listening to today's show. To check out more great cannabis podcasts, go to podconnects.com. Here's a preview of one of our other shows. Hi, my name is Kira Reed, and I'd like to invite you to be inspired by the women who are leading in the cannabis industry. Each week, we will discuss empowerment, leadership, and what it means to be a woman in charge in marijuana, hemp, and CBD. As the founder of the Women Empowered in Cannabis community, I have had the great pleasure to get to know many brilliant and talented women who are CEOs, executives, politicians, advocates, and community leaders that are focused on creating a cannabis economy that is just, fair, and equal. We'll learn how these women make decisions, how they navigate a predominantly male industry, and what they're doing to level the playing field for women. I hope you'll join us.